much for that introduction. Thank you for coming. Yeah, turn off the lights. Thank you for coming. And thanks to the library for inviting me. It's a beautiful building. I've never been here before. I've driven by it uh, many times. And I think when I got into town this afternoon, you were having your tree lighting ceremony because I saw a huge number of people next to the bank. And I didn't see a light. I didn't see a tree lit, but I went in to eat dinner. And after I came out, the tree was lit and all the people had gone. So I imagine that's what it was tonight. But uh, I remember very clearly the moment in which the idea for this book came to me. It was back in the spring of 2007. And I was reading a book that was published in 1921 by James Truslow Adams called The Founding of New England. And in that book, he had a sentence that arrested my attention. He said that the Bible and the beaver were the two mainstays of the Plymouth colony in its early years. And of course, I knew what he meant about the Bible because the uh, pilgrims were religious separatists who had come to America to practice their religion as they saw fit. But I had no idea why he had thrown beavers into the mix. So I started reading, and I went to my local library, and I soon discovered that for the better part of the first decade that the pilgrims were here, their number one source of income was trading with the Indians for beaver pelts and selling those pelts back in London. And that got me thinking, what else don't I know about the fur trade? And it turned out the answer was quite a lot. Uh, luckily for me, after reading a number of books and deciding to write this book, I uh, realized that the fur trade is an absolutely fascinating history, but more important for me, it, would one, it was one that would enable me to tell a tale of how America transformed itself from a small number of colonies hugging the eastern seaboard into a mighty transcontinental nation. And what I'm going to do tonight is give you a whirlwind tour through fur fortune and empire. People have worn furs since prehistoric times to protect them from the elements. Uh, during the medieval era, people wore fur, commoners and noblemen alike wore furs for protection from the elements, but increasingly for fashion's sake, as these French noblemen show. And then towards the end of the 1500s, the problem arose in Europe. The insatiable demand for furs had stripped the continent of a viable population of fur-bearing animals. But fortunately for the European furriers and the people who wore furs, just at that moment, another source of furs became apparent across the Atlantic in the New World. The first to experience the fur wealth of the New World were the fishermen and explorers who traded with the Indians. By the late 1500s, the French had established the first permanent fur trading outposts in what is now modern-day Canada. And then in 1609, Henry Hudson, in the employ of the Dutch, and shown here in this boat uh, wearing the red feather hat, sailed up the river that would one day bear his name. And there he found plenty of Indians with pelts to trade. And when that information got back to Europe, this is another picture of Henry Hudson, when it got back to Europe, and in particular <coughs> back to the Dutch merchants who had hired Mr. Hudson, they got very excited. And they immediately sent a number of ships over to establish the colony of New Netherland, the heart of which was New Amsterdam, or what we call Manhattan in New York City. And of all the furs that the Dutch wanted, the one that they coveted the most was that of the beaver. And the reason is underneath these outer brown, stiff guard hairs, there lies a very soft and woolly underfur or undercoat that is exceptionally good material for making soft, dense, uh, pliable, and waterproof felt that can be transformed into fashionable beaver hats. And I realize this is not a very fashionable example of a beaver hat, but it is one nonetheless. And I take my word for it, from the late 1500s up to the mid-1800s, tens of millions of people, not just men, but also women, wore beaver hats of all different styles and prices. Now, during the 1620s, the 30s, and the 40s, the Dutch traded with the Iroquois, the Mohawk, and other Indian nations up and down the coast. But they weren't the only ones here who were interested in furs. As I mentioned, the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony were actively trading for furs, as were the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay, who had established themselves in the shores of Boston Harbor in 1629. And also the French to the north in Canada. This is a painting of French voyageurs uh, 
resting on one of their treks into the wilderness. And yet another group was here, the Swedes, who had established a colony along the Delaware River in 1638, the sole purpose of which was to trade with the Indians for furs and send them back to Europe. Now, in exchange for the furs, the Europeans gave the Indians cloth, kettles, beads, and wampum, which were beads drilled out of quahog shells and whelk shells and were used as a form of currency. The Europeans also actively traded in guns and alcohol, the latter of which had a particularly pernicious impact on Indian culture throughout the entire history of the fur trade. Now, with the colonists of four different empires, all in America, all looking for furs, it was only a matter of time before they came to blows. And the first to strike was Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of New Netherland, also known as Pegleg, old Pegleg, because a cannonball had ripped off one of his legs below the knee and had been replaced by a wooden peg leg, a la Ahab. And the immediate target of Peter Stuyvesant's ire were the Swedes along the Delaware River, who were headed by this gentleman, Governor Johann Prince, who was a giant of a man. He weighed over 400 pounds, and the local Indians called him Big Belly. And the reason Stuyvesant was upset with the Swedes is because even though they were only a small colony of 200 individuals, they were taking many of the furs that the Dutch thought should be going to them. So Stuyvesant bided his time, but in 1655 his patience ran out, and he sent a mini armada of ships down to the Delaware and routed the Swedes without firing a shot. Now Stuyvesant would have liked to have done the same to the New Englanders to the north as he had done to the Swedes to the south. The problem was New England wasn't a small colony. It was a large group of colonies whose population dwarfed that of the Dutch by more than 10 to 1. So Stuyvesant, shown here on the left hand of this painting, uh, used bargaining, negotiation, and threats to try to stave off the English invasion with only limited success because as the New England colonies swelled in population, individuals from there swept into the Connecticut River Valley and onto Long Island, putting the squeeze on the Dutch. And the end game came in 1664 when English King Charles II sent over a couple of warships and without firing a shot, took over New Netherland and transformed it into the colony of New York. And during the late 1600s and early 1700s, the English spread out along the eastern seaboard and up around Hudson Bay in Canada looking for Indians to trade with. But everywhere they went, they ran into the French. And this map from 1720, a French map, shows the nub of the problem. The green area along the coast and up around Hudson Bay in Canada were the lands that were claimed by the English. The French claimed everything that was yellow and pink. And where the frontiers met, that's where most of the problems ensued. And the boiling point was reached in 1754, when disputes over the Ohio River Valley and the valuable fur trade therein sparked the French and Indian War, also called the Seven Years' War, and the one in which young George Washington got his military start. This cartoon, which was done in 1754 by Benjamin Franklin, the first political cartoon ever produced in America, was used to try to get the colonies to band together and fight against the French and Indians. And it worked very well, and of course, the colonists with their British uh, compatriots uh, beat the French and the Indians. And now the big question was, what would they do with the lands they had conquered? Uh, the Americans actually thought the fur trade was going to expand rather rapidly now that they had all this French, all the French territory. But up through the early 1770s, the American fur trade expanded hardly at all, in large part because the British wanted to give the upper hand to the British fur traders operating out of Quebec and Montreal. And they also wanted to protect the Indians beyond the Appalachians from the land-hungry English who wanted to swarm over the Appalachians and not only take over the fur trade, but also displace the Indians from their land. 
Now, this led to a lot of resentment on the part of the Americans. After all, they had shed their blood along with the British during the French and Indian War, and they felt that they also deserved to have a share of the spoils. And that resentment contributed to the outbreak of the American Revolution. And you probably know this engraving. It was done by Paul Revere. It was called the Bloody Massacre at the time, but we now call it the Boston Massacre. Now, after the war, many Americans, such as Benjamin Franklin, who's shown here in his favorite Martin fur cap, thought that once again the American fur trade would expand. But they were stymied, in large part because the British failed to evacuate the key fur trading and military outposts in the Ohio River Valley and around the Great Lakes. But there was one place in America where the American fur trade was thriving during the late 1700s, and it was along the Pacific northwest coast, where sea otters swam in the blue-green waters of the Pacific Ocean. In 1778, British Captain James Cook, in search of the fabled Northwest Passage to the Orient, ended up on the Pacific Northwest coast on Vancouver Island. And his men, who had been at sea for two years, their clothes in tatters, quickly engaged in trading sessions with local Indians giving them nails, hatchets, pieces of glass, beads, in exchange for plush sea otter pelts from which they could fashion new clothes. The men had no idea how valuable these sea otter pelts were, but when they arrived in Canton, China, they discovered that the mandarins there would pay as much as $120 for particularly prime pelts. And keep in mind, this is a time at which the average American laborer could expect to earn one to two dollars a day. So these exorbitant sums caused a near mutiny on the ships. The men wanted to go back to the Pacific Northwest and continue trading. But cooler heads prevailed, and they headed back to London. And on board one of the ships was an American named John Ledger. And when he arrived back in America in 1782, he wrote a book about his experiences with Captain Cook. It was the first book ever copyrighted in the United States. And in it, he talked about the riches that would be had by those who would go and engage in the Pacific Northwest fur trade with China, and then go on to China and sell those pelts. And this got the interest of many